Hey guys, Pastor Britton here. We're so thankful that you've decided to watch one of the sermons from our Sunday mornings here at Freedom Fellowship. We hope it's encouraging to you, uplifting to you, challenging to you. Uh, we also want to point out that these online sermons are not an adequate substitute for gathering with a body of believers on a regular basis. So we hope you enjoy the sermon, that it's beneficial to you. But at the same time, we hope that you get plugged in at a local church wherever you are. So if you're not plugged in anywhere, we, would, uh, we invite you to, to reach out to us, email us, call us, uh, and reach out to us so that we can plug you in either here at Freedom Fellowship or we can help you get plugged in at a good church wherever you are in your local community. Enjoy the sermon. Thank you, and worship team. Thank you guys for always being so faithful to lead and so heartfelt. Well, I'm glad you're here with us this morning. Hope you're glad to be here. Amen. Another day, right? God has brought us here for another day. It's all that we've got. So, so we're going to keep pushing through Ephesians this morning. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3, so if you want to go ahead and start navigating there, however you, you choose to intake God's word in your Bible, in your hands, or on your phone, or whatever. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to look this morning um, at, at, I guess the way we'd say this is looking through the eyes of Paul. Um, we've been looking through the eyes of Paul as we see this. I, I don't want you to, to misunderstand right off the bat. Um, Paul was a great man, um, and God used him mightily, but we always want to emphasize the one working through Paul, right? The one working through these these great historical figures like Paul in Scripture. We're going to look through the eyes of Paul, but ultimately what I want you to see this morning is the heart of God. So as we look at the passage in Ephesians 3 this morning, we'll just kind of start here. Um, I think it's interesting that in life, one of the things that we know is that you can have two people who see the exact same thing but they can see it completely different, right? So if you're married, you might know this, right? And if you know, you know, right? But even with your kids, anybody you know, any relationship you've got, um, you can be looking at the same thing and then still see it very different. Here's an example. Um, I don't know what this community needs, um, but I'm, I have a firm, deep, deep spiritual conviction that every community needs another really good Mexican food restaurant. So... <laughs> You know, I don't know. Um, if you don't believe that, then you've got, you've got plenty of time to get right with the Lord about that. But, um, you know, if I said, hey, guys, listen, good news. I bought some land here in, in Roanoke, and I'm going to build a top-of-the-line, high-quality Mexican food restaurant. Now, that would excite me, okay? I'd be excited. I, maybe that might be exciting to you, right? And, I, and if I just said, hey, show of hands, who would be excited about that? You know, I would assume that a lot of hands would probably go up because generally, you know, we can get excited about Mexican food. Um, but then what if I said, now here's the catch, guys. What I did was I bought the land that that library was on, and I tore that library down. Well, then that's not so good, right? Or if I said, hey, and I'm, I'm, I'm making this up, right? I know, I know you don't necessarily have these things, but, um, you know, I'm going to build this, this Mexican food restaurant. So what I did was... I, I bought this senior center where senior adults get together and they have activities. I tore that thing right on down, right, to build the Mexican food restaurant. Well, now it's a little bit different, right? So now it's, it's maybe not such a good thing, right? So I want to show you a couple things that kind of are fun. Um, we'll, we'll show them on the screen here and, and kind of just get, get this uh, idea going a little bit. So you probably have seen this. What do you see? Okay, I hear young lady, somebody sees an older woman, right? I didn't know that this actually had a name, this, this I guess it's art. Um, this, this thing is called my wife and my mother-in-law. So who sees the young woman? Show me hands, okay? Who sees the older woman, okay? Anybody not see any of it like I see a blob, right? Then there, there's a whole deeper psychological thing, I can't help you with that. Can, can anybody not see the other one? What do you, Kyle, what do you not see? Okay, I got you. So, so the, yeah, so the older woman, um, the, the, the younger woman's chin is kind of the older woman's nose, and then she's wearing kind of a shawl fur type thing. Um, 
you know, her she the older woman is wearing. You can like the woman, the younger woman's ear is the older woman's eye. You see it yet? Nope. Okay. But isn't it crazy that that two people can look at this and see two totally different things? I I love the looks I'm starting to see now. Like some of you are like, man, you're crazy. I don't see that. All right. Let's go to the next one. Let's look at the next one. This one this starts to get weird. Okay. It's the dress. Okay. It's what color is the dress? Who okay, who sees white and gold? Who sees black and blue? I can't I can't see anything but white and gold. Like John's sitting like right here in front of me and he's like, You're crazy. I can't see blue and I cannot see it. Like the so the top and then I it would like the two strips in the middle to me, those are gold. The two strips at the bottom. Yeah. The parts that y'all say are black. Now look. We one thing, you're seeing it different than I'm seeing it, right? Okay. Let's look at one more. This one's new to me. I don't know if this will work or not. What color are the shoes? Does anybody see white and pink? She sees white. Look. White and pink. So you see white and pink? Anybody else see white and pink? No. There, no, there's a whole world of people that see white and pink. I can't see white and pink. I was, and I didn't know if anybody would say they can't see anything but gray and teal. Isn't that funny? Okay, so, so we could do this all day long, but, uh, but y'all want to get to... <laughs> okay, so the point is... No, d- dead serious. The point is, we can all be looking at the same thing and see it very differently to the point where, to not belabor the point, where this group over here is going, how could it be any other way? And this group over here is saying, how in the world could you possibly see it that way, right? So that's kind of what we're going to look at in today's passage. What we might look and see and say, you know what, that's miserable. Or what we might describe as misery, or we might say that's misfortune. Paul's looking at that, and he's saying, did you see this gift? Look at this gift that God has given me. Now, here's why that matters for us to look at this. Again, we're not we're not worshiping Paul. We're not, I, I don't want to make a, a case study of Paul so much, except that Paul's a man who loves the Lord and has devoted his life to the Lord. And I believe that if we can see the world as Paul saw it, it's potentially life-changing. It truly is. If we can see this, this fun, silly stuff got nothing to do with nothing. But man, there's a lot of crazy stuff that's happening in the world. And there's a lot of circumstances that if we could just see it the way the Lord wants us to see it, it's potentially transformational, revolutionary even, for you, but for Freedom Fellowship as well. So let's look at the passage then and kind of get to this and see what it's all about. Ephesians chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things so that, Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. 
This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Let's pray real quick. Father, your word is true. It is always true. It doesn't change. Thank you, God, for giving us a standard that we can hold on to in a world where everything seems to change. God, in a world where we can truly look at the same thing and see it differently, Lord, you've given us this standard of hope that our lives as your followers are to be anchored in. Lord, I pray if somebody is here this morning that doesn't have that hope, that doesn't have that relationship with you, God, truly, in love, Lord, that you would not allow them to sit still this morning before they settle that matter with you, Lord, to put their faith in you, to trust you, even when we don't know exactly what all that means. Lord, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you this morning, I pray that they wouldn't walk out this morning, God, without experiencing a, a, an eternal change by trusting you. Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, get me out of the way. Whatever is, is said and heard, Lord, we want to hear it from you. So, Lord, please meet us here in this place and answer that prayer, Lord. It's the one we give in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want us to look this morning at, at a few things, three ways that, that Paul saw the world that really can be transformational for us. And we're going to kind of jump right into those. So first I want you to notice this. Paul considered himself a prisoner of Christ, not of people. You see that right off the bat in verse 1. Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And you'll notice, at least in the English Standard, then you, you have this hyphen there. And Paul kind of goes into um, kind of this rabbit trail. He chases this rabbit trail. We'll probably talk more about that next week. But he starts to say, hey, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Now, many, many biblical scholars believe Paul wrote Ephesians while he was a prisoner in Rome. Well, if he's a prisoner in Rome then he is a prisoner of Romans, right? That's not what Paul says. Paul says he doesn't have a prisoner of, of the Romans. He says, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Well, that sounds noble. What does it mean, though? Have you ever described yourself as a follower of Christ? If somebody says, hey, what church do you go to? You say, hey, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus at Freedom Fellowship in Roanoke. I'm pretty sure nobody's ever described themselves that way, right? But yet Paul's doing it here. It's in God's word, so it's significant. We ought to look at that. He actually says a little bit more. Not only that he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus, but he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. Now, again, we don't have biblically the exact explanation for what Paul is speaking about there, but it seems very likely if we look at the whole council, especially of the New Testament, that what's likely happened to Paul is he's been arrested. The Jews have had him arrested for being a blasphemer. Remember, Paul was preaching a message that the Jewish leaders and authorities of the day did not believe. They were all waiting on the promised Messiah. God has promised a Messiah. Jesus comes and claims to be that Messiah. And Paul believed that. Many people believe that who become Christians, right? But not everybody believed that. And so when Paul would go from town to town, preaching the gospel and saying the Messiah has arrived. Jesus is here. He's the one we've been waiting on. That made a lot of people angry. It made a lot of people say, hey, you need to stop saying that. That's not true. And so it would get Paul into some trouble. And yet Paul's ministry was marked by the unashamed proclamation of Jesus Christ and the gospel all the time. And that fact didn't sit well with the Jews. And so Paul could have said here, I, Paul, I'm a prisoner of the Jews because, you know, those Jews are always trying to get me in trouble. Or he could have said, I I'm a prisoner of the Romans. The this is our occupying force. They're in charge. Yeah, I'm a prisoner of the Romans, right? If I, if I go to prison here, I, I, I can say I'm, I'm, I'm incarcerated by the state of Texas, right? I could say that. But Paul says he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Well, how can he say that? I'll give you one word, worldview. Worldview. It's how you view the world, worldview. It's your mental filter. And everyone in this room has one. Everyone in this world has a worldview. 
Everybody sees the world. Everybody sees the pictures through a set of eyes. And then you have an opinion about it. That's what worldview is. Well, the Bible teaches that God's sovereign over everything. Amen? And that nothing is beyond God's control, right? That's what the Bible teaches. And Paul believed it, and he lived his life accordingly. There was nothing man could do to Paul. Now, we're starting to build toward, like, why does this matter? There was nothing man could do to Paul. There was only what God was allowing in Paul's life. And Paul knew that God only allows things that fit into his sovereign purposes. God doesn't do things and go, let's just spin this off and see what happens, and maybe it does something, maybe it doesn't. It's not the way God works. God has a purpose in everything he does. Sometimes we do things that are very efficient and right, and then sometimes, man, I, don't, I do things in the least efficient, least effective way, and it's like, man, I just made a mess of this whole thing. God is the model, literally, the model and standard of efficiency. God does not waste motion. When God does it, it's significant, and it's right. Now, if we could think about our lives like this, like Paul does, and this kind of changing uh, uh, thinking changes everything. Here's an example. When things get tough, and we have this kind of mindset like Paul's got here, we don't do what we tend to do sometimes, which is what? Blame others. Or we say, well, I've just got bad luck. Or, man, I'm just cursed. I don't mind telling you, I've had some low seasons in my life where I've told my wife, I'm cursed. I'm just meant to, to do, even, I can spiritually make it sound good. Like, well, no, it's not, it's not that, that God's got it in for me. It's just that God's meant my life to be an example of bad things so everybody can see the bad things happening to somebody and then maybe God uses that somehow. And you know, she's, she's looking at the picture of my life through a different lens and going, that doesn't make any sense. But I'm just sitting here going, well, something's happening. When we look at things like Paul does, we don't say something's happening. When we, when we see life as this series of unconnected, random, things out of the blue, victimized, it just happens to me because I'm cursed. When we see life that way, it's actually kind of dangerous and it's a problem. You know why? Because to believe that then is to not give glory to God for what God's doing. You know, a, a sense when we say give glory to God, what we're saying is give credit to God. Give credit to God. So when I don't do that, I'm not giving credit to God. I'm saying, God, the Bible says that nothing happens outside of your sovereignty, but there's some stuff over here happening that I'm not necessarily willing. There's got to be some other reason. There's got to be something else that's going on here. The Bible says that there are spiritual forces in this world always at work, whether you want to believe it or not, and those forces are working for you, and some of those forces are working against you. That's the truth. Romans 8, 28. I've heard a lot of Romans talking here. I think both of the Sunday morning classes are looking at Romans, right? Is that right? Both classes doing Romans? Did y'all do Romans this morning? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God works all things together for good. Take your worst situation, take your baffling, I don't get this situation. When is Romans 8.28 not true over that situation? Yeah, but it's this one's really bad. God's working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Colossians 1.16 and 17, For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones or dominions or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's truth no matter what's happening in our lives. I like this one. Paul kind of already snuck it by us in this, this line of thinking biblically. Ephesians 1.11, probably not one you went and talked to your lunch group about or went home and talked about, but here it is. In him we have obtained an, inherit an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. How many things? All things. Yeah, but I'm in prison, God. 
He works all things according to the counsel of his will. Paul believed that. Do you? Do I? When we believe this, it truly can transform us. It can change your prayer life. It can change a lot of things, but the ones I just thought of immediately. How does this kind of thinking, if I just see the world like Paul seeing it here, how does that change my prayer life? It takes me from, God, why is this happening? To, God, use me. God, this hurts. I don't like this. But, God, show me what you're doing here. Show me how you want to use me. You see the difference? God, why? To, God, teach me what you want to teach me through this. What about the level of peace in our hearts? Lots of things can happen that can shake us, but when we have this kind of mindset, I believe it it maybe does not completely eliminate. In other words, I'm not trying to say, boy, if you'll just see the world like Paul seeing it here, you'll never be afraid of anything again, or you'll never experience chaos in your life. I'm not saying that. But I will say that you won't nearly be as shaken by the attacks that we have faced and the adversity that we face and the difficulty that we face every stinking day. How, how can that be? Because we become confident of this truth that God reminds us of and we remind one another of that God's at work. If God's at work, then I can have faith that he's doing something. And if God's doing something, it's always good, right? I don't have to like it. If God's at work, he is doing something good. You know, I'm not going to string off on this too much, but how many times have I prayed, God, I just want to see you work in my life. Have you prayed that prayer? Like, God, move. God, do something. God, use me in a bold way. And I, I can't quantify it for you. How many times then... God has probably responded to that by putting me in some kind of a situation that hurts and is uncomfortable for me because he's working things out for good. And I go, whoa, 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 God, 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 get me out of this. God, move. God, do something. Well, as long as it doesn't hurt. And I think it's transformational life-altering, if we can, and maybe the better way to say this is not to just, hey, just adopt the mindset today, but to get on that road and to remind one another, it's part of what we do is, as the church, followers of Christ, brothers and sisters, to remind one another that God is at work. Through the bad stuff, through the good stuff, God's at work. And if he's at work, it's good. All right, let's look at the second thing. Paul saw difficulties through the lens of stewardship more than struggle. He saw the difficulties of his life through a lens of stewardship more than struggle. There's a, a phrase in the passage that we're looking at this morning that's used multiple times, and I'll always tell you those are worth marking. There's always something there. That phrase is God's grace. God's grace. In verse 2, Paul describes his plight as a stewardship of God's grace given to me for you. And then in verse 7, he says he's a minister of the gospel according to the gift of God's grace, given him by God's power. And then one more time in verse 8, he hits it again, and he, he refers to his ministry as this grace that was given. Now, don't forget what's happening in Paul's life around this. Like, that all sounds really good. You know, if I come up here and I start talking about, man, this grace of God and this gift that's been given to me, that sounds good. Except don't forget, at the very beginning of the verse, and it's one of, I think, three or four places in Ephesians, he's a prisoner. Don't forget that. And then in the last verse of this part of the passage, verse 13, he's referring to maybe some of the distress that the Ephesians are feeling for him, and he's saying, hey, yes, I'm suffering. It's okay. So he's talking about the suffering sandwich, I guess you could say. There's prisoner on one side and suffering on the other, and in the middle he's saying, check out God's grace. Will you look at God's grace? Now, what do we 
see here not only that he's talking about it as grace, but he's, he's saying stewardship. Well, what's stewardship? What do we mean when we talk about stewardship? I guess one way that I might describe stewardship is there's an expectation of care for something that's been given, right? We're to be good stewards of something. We're to take care of it. That makes sense, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, a funny one comes to mind, actually, that I hadn't thought about. When I was a kid, I saw this commercial for this, um, like, slime chamber thing. Um, and back when it was probably toxic, who knows. But you would put your little, drop your little guy into this chamber, and then you'd pour your slime in the top, and then you'd, like, shut the lid down and, like, squeeze it or do something to it, and slime would come oozing out. Why that is a toy and sounds fun, I don't know. I was a boy. But I saw it on TV, had to have it, had to have it, had to have it. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. And so it was kind of like I wanted it, but I didn't really think I'd get it, honestly. And, and I think I'd seen it in the store, and it was like some price that I knew we couldn't afford, you know. And so lo and behold, on Christmas, I get this slime machine thing, and it was disgusting. I remember being horrified from the second I opened it up, and it was just like, I'm not touching this. I literally took it from the living room outside and threw it over the fence into the neighbor's yard, <laughs> right? And, and I remember my mom was like, what are you doing, right? Well, when you think about it, you know, my mom didn't care so much that, um, I mean, I guess the financial situation is not good. Like, we just paid money for that, and you threw it over the fence now, and you're never going to get it back. But when we give a gift, when you give a, a child a gift or a grandchild a gift, and it ends up in the floor, what do you say? Like, hey, don't pick that up. It's going to get broken if you just leave it down in the floor like that, right? Well, do you really care if it's broken? Not so much. But when you give it to somebody, you have this expectation that they're going to enjoy it, that they're going to use it, right? Like, I don't want to get it, and then it just gets broken and not used, right? Well, that's kind of what Paul is talking about here, but in a way that's hard for us to understand. So what does he mean when he's talking about stewardship in his situation? He saw his, his ministry and the suffering that came with it as a gift from God. That alone is really hard to process. But he saw his ministry and the suffering that came with it as a gift from God. And he saw the circumstances of his life not as something done to him then, but done for him and for others. Do you get how baffling that is? You're not doing anything to me. God's doing something for me. And he says on, the, on behalf of you Gentiles, not only that, God's doing something for you. And as such, then Paul believed that he needed to be a good steward of that gift. There's a really great summary. You don't have to flip there. Really great summary of this gift of Paul's ministry in, in 2 Corinthians 11. You might go look back sometime. This is not one of those uh, verses that you're going to see on T-shirts or put on posters at, at the Mardell's. But, man, give me a grasp, Paul, of what your ministry has been like. Let's, tell me about this gift. Here, here, Paul, tell you about the gift. Ready? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, Danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from all that, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. You feel called to ministry? Paul said, God's given me a gift. And not only has God given me a gift, I've got to steward the gift. I've got to take care of that gift. I've got to nurture it. What if you began to see every circumstance in your life as a gift? We like to credit God, give glory to God about certain things. Gosh, even, even getting up and standing here and saying, hey, here we are, another day. You know, we often say, God's given me another day. Is that true? It is true. Because if God had numbered my days and my last day was yesterday, I wouldn't be standing with you this morning. I just believe that. I didn't just happen to wander into another day. God's given me another day. What if we began to see every circumstance of our life as a gift from God? Every circumstance 
of our life. Every season. What if every hard thing was not something being done to you, but for you? That shift alone is huge. The world's not doing stuff to me. God's doing stuff for me. You see how crazy that is to everybody outside of the walls of this church? I can't tell you the people that I've known in my life, in my faith life, who have gone through incredibly hard things like death and horrible tragedy. And they just exude the peace of Christ in those moments. And it is so hard for my heart to grasp sometimes. I'm just being honest with you. Like I could stand here and go, and boy, I get it. But I think genuinely, if I'm just being honest, I see that sometimes and I go, how? How? Because those people have that peace in their heart of knowing stuff's not being done to me. God's doing stuff for me. What if every hard thing was a gift to steward, to take care of, to nurture? Every gift is not bad, obviously, right? Most gifts we would associate with being something good, and maybe that's part of the problem. When it's bad, we say not a gift. When it's good, we say gift. And some gifts don't hurt, thank God, right? Like s- some of us have some financial ability we don't didn't have before that, that allows us to live comfortably, or you've got some kind of talent God has given you or some kind of gift like that. Some don't hurt, but some do. And Paul remembered, in all things, God's got a purpose in it. What are some of the worst things happening in your life right now? Take five seconds. What's what's one of the worst things happening in your life right now? And is it possible then that God is using that thing to not only work his purposes out for you, but for others? I think it's entirely possible. All right, let's look at this third thing real quick. Paul also saw the church as a messenger, not a monument. This goes a lot along with what Val said this morning. I was really touched by what he said. And and I had planned on saying this anyway, so I'm, I'm glad Val's kind of doubling up on it. But don't forget your penny. Like if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't forget the person in your life that the world would look at and say, That person has no value. I'm not sure they could ever do anything great for the church. Even if they did come to my church, I'm not sure. They're they're so far gone. We won't even see it. God sees every penny, which represents a human life and a soul, with the highest value. There's somebody in your life, if you will just look and see, there's somebody in your life that needs to be here, but more than needs to be here, needs to hear the message of Christ and the truth of Christ. Or they need encouragement. Look at verse 9. So Paul writes here in verse 9. I'm going I'm to back up to 8. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for God in ages in God? Excuse me, mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So Paul said he was made a messenger of the gospel so people would come to faith. When people come to faith in Christ, they become the body of Christ, the church. And then one of the main duties of the church I guess we want to say it that way, is proclamation. You know, when you worship, like again, and and Steve will mention this sometimes, man, I'm I'm lockstep. You're not just standing there singing songs. And when we say what what you should be doing is worshiping, well, that sounds good, but it's kind of vague. What are you doing? You're looking at truth, and you're proclaiming it. You're proclaiming truth. When you tell other people, and we've talked about testimony before, when you tell other people about what Jesus has done in your life, 
You're proclaiming truth. When you tell people about Scripture, you're proclaiming truth. When you choose to either live with the mindset that Paul has or you choose not to, you're proclaiming or you're making a proclamation. Do you realize that there are people that are watching you as followers of Christ and they want to know who Jesus really is and they're seeing how you proclaim him? Are you proclaiming truth? Now, Paul says that the church is to proclaim truth so that, two of my favorite words in the Bible, because they help me understand why, because the manifold wisdom of God then can be made known to all. Manifold wisdom of God, not a phrase that we would use a lot, means the abundant, beyond comprehension wisdom of God. That's what the church is to do. Well, who is that? That's your neighbors. That's your friends. That's your coworkers. That's your family. You know who else it is? It's, it's the mayor, it's the governor, it's the senators, it's the presidents, it's the prime ministers, it's everybody. And, and we won't get a lot in this today, but Paul even says that message is to be proclaimed to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now he's speaking of the spiritual realm, okay, not heaven necessarily. When Paul says the truth, God's truth needs to be proclaimed, does God need to hear it? Does, are, we, are we telling God something he doesn't know? No. Does God want to hear that? He does. God wants to hear you proclaim truth in your prison. God, you're good. You're always doing something. God doesn't need me to inform him of that, but he wants me to tell him that. You know who else in the spiritual realm needs to hear truth? Satan and all of his demons. You don't have authority over me as a follower of Christ. You just need to be reminded of that today, Satan. Everybody, everybody is to hear that proclamation. And remember, Paul's life and circumstances, he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, and then he traveled the world preaching the gospel. After he was imprisoned, that slowed him down, and then he could no longer preach the gospel, right? Wrong. He wrote letters proclaiming the gospel. Well, when he started to suffer, he got quiet like we tend to do when we suffer. I don't know about you. I, I, I kind of pull in and get quiet when I suffer. No, not Paul. He's still proclaiming the gospel. Do you know the difference between a messenger and a monument? You ever thought about that? They both give testimony, Right? I think there's a, I don't know about Roanoke. I know over in Grapevine, there's like a 9-11 firefighters memorial. Anybody familiar with that? It's a monument. Does that monument tell a story? It does. Monuments tell a story of history or significance. They can tell a story, a lot of things. Something important happened here. Or here's an important group of people that we want to remember, right? They speak. The difference between a messenger and a monument is a messenger is mobile. A monument only speaks in that spot, right? I can't read. I couldn't tell you what the monument says standing right here today in Roanoke. It, it can speak to me, can give testimony to me if I'm standing right there on the spot. But a messenger is different. A messenger is on the move. And that's what Paul was. He was a messenger spreading the gospel all over the world. And we're to be that. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, hey, be an imitator of me as I am of Christ. So we're to do that as well. Jesus took his saving message on the move. Paul took the message of the gospel on the move. And now as the church... We are to take that message on the move. That's significant sometimes because sometimes I think we wait for people to come to us. That's just kind of the truth. Like, man, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to tell you about Jesus if you just get into my address right here. I'll tell you about him. We need to take the message on the move to proclaim that truth. 
So I want to challenge this morning as we kind of wrap up. How might God be calling you to, one, embrace the circumstances of your life, no matter what they are, so that you would see them as a gift to be stewarded? I know that's hard. Hard for me to stand here and say that to you and know that in five days I might be in a crisis telling myself, well, yeah, you stood up in front of everybody on Sunday and said this is something that is a gift to be stewarded, but yeah, that's not so easy for me. How might God be calling you to embrace the circumstances of your life as gifts from God, from God to be stewarded so that the gospel might be heard loud and clear everywhere you go? You are giving a testimony. It's kind of like we say about discipleship. Everybody's being discipled. They are. They may not call it discipleship. They might call it brainwashing or something else. And don't get me wrong, I'm not comparing the two. But there's a whole world of marketers that want to take your mental attention and train you to act in a certain way. Cha-ching, that's the thing. Well, in the same way that everybody's trying to disciple, but there's one real way of discipleship through Christ, right? Your life is giving a testimony. Your life is giving a testimony. Paul's life, even in prison, gives a testimony that's noteworthy. How can this guy in prison who's suffering, who's been through all the things that he's been through, how can he call that a ministry? And how can he say, thank you, God, for the gift. And thank you, God, that I'm going to take, I'm going to use this gift. I'm not just going to throw it over the fence and say, eh, 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 not me. I'm going to use it. So as we go into this time of response this morning, uh, again, I use this time to really connect with God in some way. Maybe God's spoken to your heart through the, the specific part of the passage. Maybe God's spoken to your heart in some way that we hadn't even talked about this morning. The important thing is to respond to God. This is a time I'm going to stand here at the front. I'll be glad to pray with you about anything you might want to pray about here. Anybody you might want to pray for. You can grab somebody in the the crowd out here. Let them pray with you or for you. And if you're here today, I'm always going to say, if you're here today and you haven't made that decision to trust Christ, and maybe you've been here week after week after week after week after week, and you just don't want everybody to know that that's not true, I would tell you, who gives a rip? today make it today why not today i don't care what everybody else thinks jesus i need to get right with you and so i can help you talk about that and by the way if you don't know what that looks like i'm not going to stand up here and do that we'll we'll counsel with you and figure out a way to talk to you in a place where it's a little more private for your sake right so we're not trying to to front you out or make you look embarrassed or anything like that but man respond to how the lord is speaking to your heart this morning whatever that looks like let's pray Father,